Media Shadow presents the audiobook of My Confession, Recollections of a Rogue, written and illustrated by Samuel Chamberlain, read by Media Shadow, introduction and postscript by Roger Butterfield. The publishing rights of this book are retained by the West Point Museum, who have graciously granted me permission through a usage agreement to record and release this audiobook for free for educational purposes. And now, My Confession. Introduction. This book is a wonderfully fresh and exciting historical discovery. To read Samuel Chamberlain's private memoirs and look at his long hidden pictures of the Mexican War is like stepping back at once into another America. In the 1840s, the United States was a boisterous teenager among the nations, bursting with energy, spoiling for a fight, careless of its wild oats, ever ready to gush sentimental tears, and absolutely certain of its manifest destiny to expand all over the map. Private Sam Chamberlain of the U.S. Army embodied these qualities, expressed them in action, and put them on paper in pictures and words. He wrote his own title, My Confession, on page one of his manuscript, and an amazing confession it is. How he came to write this book, how it remained in obscurity for nearly 100 years, and only recently came to light, is an interesting bit of history in itself. Samuel Emerly Chamberlain, his full name, was born on November 27, 1829, at Center Harbor, New Hampshire. His regular schooling must have been brief, but he read a great deal, even as a boy, and in later years owned a large library. There is nothing in the record to explain his artistic ability, though his father's occupation, stonecutter, suggests the ancient Yankee skill of engraving death's heads and weeping angels on village tombstones. When Sam was small, the family moved to Boston, where his father died in 1844. That was the same year that 15-year-old Sam took off for Illinois to begin the story which is told in his memoirs. In 1854, he came back to Boston, where he soon married and began raising a family. In time, he became a prominent citizen, a holder of public office, and a brevet brigadier general at the end of the Civil War. But he found it hard to put aside the adventures of his youth, and he began to compile, for his own amusement, a very long, profusely illustrated, handwritten account of the men he had killed, the girls he had loved, the joyous fights, and escapes he had during the ten years of roaming and soldiering in Mexico and the Old Wild West. Most of Chamberlain's narrative is devoted to his experiences as a cavalryman in the Mexican War, 1846 to 1848. He carried a sketchbook throughout the war and drew pictures as gifts for his fellow soldiers and officers. When he sat down to write his private book, he embellished it with nearly 100 large drawings, brilliantly colored and full of action. He also decorated the written pages of his text with colored initials and headings, pen and ink vignettes, and richly worked script in a manner of a medieval monk laboring over an illuminated manuscript. The resulting document is both a work of art and a fascinating story of romantic shenanigans and war. The original manuscript contains 380 pages and approximately 175,000 words, written in a smooth-flowing, easy-to-read hand and bound in a tall volume like a bookkeeper's ledger. Chamberlain's literary style was obviously influenced by the melodramatic fiction, which was popular in the 1850s, and he may have started writing with publication in mind. Later on, as a substantial family man with a public reputation, he might well have decided against it, but he was always proud of his book made no secret of it with his family, and occasionally showed it to outsiders. After his death in 1908, his widow made sure it would not be lost or destroyed. Apparently, the manuscript was all written between the years 1855 and 1861, when Chamberlain went off again to fight in the Civil War. It remained in the possession of his family until the 1940s, when it turned up in an antique shop in Connecticut. A Baltimore collector bought it and showed it last year to a life correspondent, who had called on him about another assignment. The reporter notified his editors in New York, and Life purchased the manuscript outright. A condensed version of the text and a number of Chamberlain's drawings were published in three Life issues last summer. The present book contains nearly five times as much of Chamberlain's original text as the Life articles, and 55 of Sam's best pictures. Its publication in this permanent form will be welcomed by everyone interested in the American past. For general readers, its vivid writing and illustrations will bring to life the almost forgotten war with Mexico, which added California, Arizona, and New Mexico to the map of the United States, and also fastened Texas securely to the Union. 
Whatever the causes of that war, and most historians now believe that both sides had a hand in bringing it on, it was a resounding triumph for the tough little American army, which was the underdog in numbers all the way through the conflict. Chamberlain's narrative describes in detail the amazing victory of Buena Vista, and it probably tells more of the life of the common soldier in Mexico than any other account. Here are the casual violence and amours that filled the fighting man's time between his battles, his feuds with officers, the brutal horseplay, and harsh discipline of the unruly army camp. Here too is a startling revelation of the fraternizing between American invaders and Mexican civilians, male and female, and the guerrilla warfare, which was the other side of the picture, a silent secret slaughter that went on endlessly behind the lines and struck more terror in American hearts than any one battle. There is much here also that is not connected with the war, about what life was like on the stagecoaches and steamboats in the Mississippi River towns, the saloons of San Antonio, and the outlaw territory of this far southwest a century ago. Official records of the National Archives in Washington provide proof that Sam was really there. These papers show that he enlisted in the Illinois Foot Volunteers at Alton on June 12, 1846, when he was still only 16 years old. On September 8, 1846, he was discharged at San Antonio and signed up on the same day for five years in the 1st Regiment of the United States Dragoons, listing his occupation as laborer, and swearing he was over 21. Attached to this document is a curious affidavit signed by his captain, Enoch Steen, which reads in part, I certify on honor that I have minutely inspected the recruit, Samuel E. Chamberlain, previously to his enlistment, and that he was entirely sober when enlisted. This soldier has gray eyes, light hair, light complexion, is six feet two inches high. The final entry on Sam's Mexican War record is a return of the first dragoons, which lists him as a deserter, under date of March 22, 1849. By this time, the regiment was in Los Angeles and was losing men fast to gold fever. Sam has a somewhat different story. He says he was honorably discharged from the dragoons in Mexico, joined their expedition to California as a civilian wagon master, and ran away to a band of outlaws because an officer confiscated his sketchbook and chained him to a tree. But he certainly did desert somewhere and some time, and as far as the War Department is concerned, he is a deserter to this day. In dealing with matters of this kind, the editors of Harper's have very properly let Sam tell his story in his own words and in his own way so long as no serious violence to history was involved. It is quite obvious that there are many inaccuracies in his original manuscript. His urge to glorify himself on the battlefield and in the boudoir led him into exaggeration and even invention. He was careless or ignorant about names, dates, and other details, including his use of the Spanish language and English grammar and punctuation. Some of his more serious errors, the outright fictional passages, have been omitted from this book. Others have been corrected in the text or through the use of footnotes. Still others of a minor nature have been allowed to stand. This applies to his eccentric spellings and also to the use of words like greaser, which are just as offensive to most Americans today as they are to Mexicans. Such expressions remain in the interest of preserving the flavor of the author's original narrative. It should be pointed out also that Chamberlain was no more disparaging towards the Mexican population than he was to the disorderly American volunteer troops who swarmed over northern Mexico, pillaging and mistreating the inhabitants in defiance of orders and common decency. Sam was often assigned to round up these hoodlums, using violence when necessary. His memoirs contain as much about American atrocities as they do about the Mexican variety, and he expressed admiration for Mexican bravery and patriotism. If his accounts of the fighting come out one-sided, that is quite understandable. Sam was an American soldier in a hostile foreign land, and this is his personal story. Roger Butterfield, 1956. Chapter 1. I Leave Home The day was cold and drear in December 1844 when I bid goodbye to my friends at the Worcester Depot in the good city of Boston and embarked on the train for Norwich en route for the Great West. I was in my 16th year, full of life yet felt sad and downhearted enough at leaving home for years, if not forever. What a change the last few months had made in my prospect for life. From a promising member of the Baptist Church in Bowdoin Square and a prospective theological student at the Northampton Institute, I was now, to quote the language of Rev. R. W. Cushman, of the above church, worse than the devil. What had produced this change? Who was to blame? Well, I confess I was to blame. I was the cause. 
I had been strictly brought up under religious influences, my reading confined to the Bible and the usual books of a Sabbath school library, and at 14 I considered it my duty to become a member of the church. At 15, I unfortunately, for my religious career, joined the junior class at Sheridan's Gymnasium on Washington Street, and here, under the tender instructions of Belcher Kay and Prof. Joe Long in sparring, and Monsieur Hurry in the stick and small sword, I soon developed into a muscular Christian. And alas, such is the pernicious influence of the ungodly, that one night in a set-to with the professor, when I succeeded in getting one in on his knob, I felt more elated than if I had just been ordained over a flourishing church. Then I got hold of Scott's immortal works. What a glorious new world opened before me. How I devoured their pages. Oh, how I longed to emulate his heroes. I took pride in all athletic exercises and was anxious for a chance to use my strength and skill in defense of oppressed beauty. One Sunday on my way to church, I was insulted by a rough, and on my remonstrating with him for using profane language on the Holy Sabbath, he, with a fearful oath, struck at me. Now while I was ready to forgive the sinner for his insult to me, I felt it was my Christian duty to punish him for his blasphemy. With my right, I neatly stopped his blow and landed a stinger on his potato trap with my left duke, drawing the claret and sending him to the grass. The rowdy got up and ran down Chardon Street, and I turned to cross over, when I saw one of our good deacons with his two lovely daughters passing. From their looks, I knew they had witnessed the little unpleasantness. This alarmed me at first, but when I caught sight of a merry twinkle in the good deacon's eyes and an admiring glance from the young ladies, I felt safe. Other members had seen the incident, and the matter was brought before the church. I was cited before the committee, where I somewhat astonished the worthies by my plea that I consciously believed that I had acted as a good Christian should act, and for the interest of the church. My good friends appeared for me, and I was cleared of all sinful intention in this wholesome rebuke to a sinner. Without egotism, I must confess, however, painful it may be to my feelings that I had always been a rather a favorite with the young sisters. But this little affair gave the darling such inflated ideas of my prowess that I was in great demand as an escort for them home on prayer meeting nights, monthly concerts, etc. Among the many beautiful girls, there were two who were allowed by all to be preeminent, yet of different styles. One, a splendid brunette with magnificent black eyes and hair, Miss Anna D. was all the world to me. The other, blue-eyed beauty with a face of an angel, was a most arrogant coquette, Miss Caroline W., who caused more heartburning among the pious young brethren than all the rest of the sisters united. Our worthy minister's son, Austin S. Cushman, was the favorite one, yet she would flirt in the most angelic manner with many others. The minister took sides with his son and gave me a severe lecture for going home with the flirt, though there was a perfect understanding between her, Miss Anna, and myself. I did not take him very kindly, and by too free expression of my thoughts made him my enemy. My lessons at the gymnasium continued, and I there formed new associates who were not exactly of the same religious principles as those of Bowdoin Square Church, but good fellows nevertheless. My religious record was culminating to a crisis, and soon the bolt fell. One night at singing school, the singing master David Payne, who was also the organist for the church, was ungentlemanly enough to call out the name of my adored one for whispering. The sensitive, high-toned beauty overcome at the painful insult burst into tears. I first rushed to her assistance, but finding the sisters were assisting her, I turned on the inhuman author of her woe and declared that no gentleman would thus insult a lady. His answer was to order me to leave the vestry in school. On my declining to do so, he proceeded to put me out. Shades of Belcher K forbid, Harry of the Wind, Ivanhoe, Don Quixote inspire me to meet this shameless oppressor of girls' rights. He clinched me, and then all the long pent-up knight errantry and the seven champions of Christendom consolidated in me burst and pain lay prostate, bleeding, almost annihilated. The tears of my loved one was revenged in blood. But the end was not yet. I had struck a most romantic attitude and exclaimed, Time! when I was beset by foes, and though I fought like another black knight, yet I was overcome by numbers and dragged out. My lady love brought out my personal effects, and we retreated to her paternal mansion. Her governor thanked me warmly for resenting the insult to his darling, and that night in the hall my beautiful brunette vowed to be mine and mine alone forever. So with swelled face, black eye, and cut lip, I returned her vows, and home in a most blissful dream of happiness. 
This was too glaring an act of mine to let pass, and I was again summoned before the outraged church. Some of my friends, the good deacon Wilbur, Calvin Haven, and a few others worked hard defending me, but I was expelled. And then my good shepherd, Reverend R. W. Cushman, pronounced me as worse than the devil. Coming from such an authority, what an excellent character for a boy not yet 16. One consolation was left me, the love of my beautiful brunette, my own queen of hearts. I called at her house. She received me coldly, but explained that, though she still loved me and always should, yet her parents had forbid her seeing me after this interview, and she must respect their wishes, and she vowed that though she would obey them in this, she would never marry another. Thus, I lost confidence in women's love and faith in religion and went forth shunned as if I was another Cain. I had at this time formed the acquaintance of Bob Jones, scenic artist at the National Theater, which was now seeing its palmy days, and of his lovely daughter Fanny, Densus, who was all the rage of the city bloods. I was soon good friends with the charming Fanny and was her regular escort home from the theater. She was as charming in mind as in person, in character above suspicion. I found myself a general favorite with all outside the church, with the pugs I was looked upon as a promising future member. The thespians found me a useful friend, the bohemians of the press were beholden to me for many a sensational item, and the ladies, well, I was a boy of a man's proportion, muscles like steel, not bad looking, and very modest. I felt unhappy, reckless, and tried in the pleasures of my new life to forget the old. Yet amid all the sensual enjoyments of the times, I often felt contrite and sighed for my former career, and then one kind word would have reclaimed me. But that word was never spoken. In December 1844, I made up my mind to go west and hunt up an uncle of mine, one Adam Chamberlain, who lived somewhere in Illinois. So after this long digression, I go back to where I started, in the cars bound for Norwich, with a sinking pain at heart. The train left the Worcester Depot at four o'clock, and it seemed to me as if I had left behind all that was worth living for. All the world was before me, but it had no allurements for me. Oh, how I longed to be back as I was a year before. If I could only live my life over again, I thought, and I not yet 16. As we dashed across the back bay, the snow commenced to fall and the would-be hero fell fast asleep. At Norwich, I awoke and embarked on the steamer John W. Richmond for New York. The sound was full of floating ice, which with a heavy snowstorm made the passage anything but a pleasant one. Several times we run onto huge cakes of ice, jarring the boat from stem to stern. The bell was kept ringing, the steam whistle shrieking. The ladies would rush out of their staterooms in fright. There was but little sleeping on the boat that night. In New York, I took a cab for the Jersey Ferry, rode up one street and down another, and found myself close to the pier from where I started. The ferry being the next ship, for this little experience in New York style, the cabbie only charged me the sum of two dollars. I thought it dear at fifty cents and said that was all I would give. He threatened to keep my trunk, whereupon I caught hold of one handle as he hung on to the other. As he pulled back, I gave a shove, when in order to save himself from falling, he let go, and I gained the ferry boat in safety. That night I stopped in Baltimore and then took the cars for Cumberland via Harper's Ferry. Owing to some six inches of snow on the track, our progress was very slow, even with the assistance of an extra engine. We arrived at Harper's Ferry about noon. The dinner bells of the hotels were ringing, and the conductor shouted, 20 minutes for dinner! The men rushed for the dining rooms, paying 50 cents for the fare. The landlord was a long time carving and serving, and not more than a half a dozen had commenced to eat when the engine bell rung. The cry was, all aboard! This trick upon travelers was too palpable to pass, even with me, and when a jolly-faced old gentleman cried out, Help yourselves, gentlemen! I obeyed orders with a hearty good will by sequestering a roast chicken and apple pie. In spite of the remonstrance of the outflanked landlord, the table was relieved of all of its edibles, and we ate our dinner in the car with our lady passengers to grace the feast, and a right jolly time we had of it. I shared my plunder with two elderly ladies who contributed by producing a well-filled lunchbox and a pocket companion of good brandy. We reached Cumberland at dark, a glowing fire in the parlor and a hot supper set us all rights and prepared us for a cold night's ride in the mountains. This being the terminus of the B&O Railroad, although there was two foot of snow on the ground, the stages that run to Wheeling were on wheels, without buffalo robes, nothing but straw to keep our limbs from freezing, the thermometer was down to zero degrees. I secured a back seat and the center one, with a man on one side and a lady on the other. 
I offered the latter my seat as being warmer, but it was declined. It was so dark outside that I could form no idea whether she was old or young, handsome or ugly, but I was certain she was not one of my brandy-drinking acquaintances of the dinner, as she had concluded to stop in Cumberland overnight, and when we left they were at their fourth glass of hot peach and honey. Wrapping myself up in my fur-lined overcoat, I tried to sleep, but it was so bitter cold I could not rest. I would drop into an uneasy slumber, disturbed by horrid dreams, and would awake numb with cold. The miserable night ended at last, and when the early dawn gave us light, I gave an anxious look at my bowers. The right one was a 250-pound negro, his breath a villainous compound of whiskey, tobacco, and onions. I gave him a shove when a gentle sigh drew my attention to my left. By Venus, what a contrast, a young and lovely girl, richly and warmly clothed in velvet and furs, was reclining her head on my shoulder, fast asleep. I got rid of my sable friend on my right and devoted my whole attention to my friend on the left. I found it necessary to preserve her equilibrium to put my arm around her, and we passed over many a mile when a sudden jolt awoke the beauty who looked at me with surprise and apologized for the freedom she took in using my shoulder, and I for being so familiar as to have my arm where it was, as I deemed it necessary to keep her from falling. We were soon chatting away as if we had been acquainted all our lives, but then it didn't take long to be intimate when parties have slept together. She informed me she was the daughter of the late Senator Fulton of Arkansas, who died recently in Washington. His remains had been shipped from New York to New Orleans, she said that she had been three terms to the Georgetown Female Seminary and was now on her way home with a gentleman, her guardian, who she pointed out the red-faced old gentleman who gave orders to secure our dinner at Harper's Ferry. She was a great talker, and her eyes that were jet black, how they would sparkle, dance, and flash as she run on. How fast her questions came. Before we stopped to breakfast, I knew her whole story, and she as much of mine as I chose to tell. She was sorry I was a Yankee, but when I assured her that I had never made a wooden nutmeg or peddled a wooden clock in my life, she thought better of me. She was some three years older than myself, and when she found this out, she commenced to patronize me most fearfully. After a hearty breakfast of bacon and eggs, broiled chicken, corn and wheat bread, butter, honey, and coffee, we again started on our way. I made an objection to having his sable majesty ride inside, but I was verdant to southern customs. A young Victorian, the master of the negro, got into a rage and swore that the boy was worth twelve thousand dollars and doggone his buttons if he would allow him to catch his death a cold for all the cursed Yankees that ever wore store clothes. I did not object to his care for his property, but the contemptuous allusion to myself rather excited me. I felt as if Plymouth Rock, Bunker Hill, and the Frog Pond weighed on my shoulders. I had taken this representative of the Southern chivalry by the collar when the voice of my beauty made me recollect that there was ladies present. What a little tempest she was. She declared that the Negro should not ride in this coach, that his master was a mean white, that if the Negro caught cold and died, she would pay for him, but ride in the same coach he should not. Her guardian laughed at the rage of his ward when her violent rage subsided in hysterical tears, but her point was gained. The Virginian, with a savage look at me, took passage with his chattel in another coach. We had the back seat all to ourselves, and as her jolly old guardy gave her a heavy lap robe, we got along very comfortably. Coming to a long steep hill, most of the passengers got out to walk. There being a strong crust of snow on the walking was excellent. She gave me an introduction to Mr. Wyman, her guardian. At first, he was as crusty as the snow, but gradually thawed and produced a bottle of cordial. And after we each took a drink, he showed me more cordiality. He soon got tired, left us, and resumed his seat in the coach. Her ladyship's tongue ran faster than ever. She described her home, the imaginary home of Claude Melotte, paled before her description of the, her paradise on the Arkansas of the cotton fields. The hundred slaves, and she the sole heiress of all. During this walk, she often said, It's too bad you're a Yankee. How I wish you were a Southerner. The day passed pleasantly enough, walking up hills and riding down with a gorgeous dinner and supper at the wayside inns. At the place where we got supper, Mr. Wyman purchased a heavy quilt for his fiery little charge, and when we took our seats for another night's ride, we were well prepared for it. With our furs, robe, and quilt, and back seat all to ourselves and pressed in each other's arms, we thought the weather had wonderfully moderated. We felt no cold. In fact, we were all in a glow, and if our lips did meet in blissful kisses, it could not be wondered at. 
We at last fell asleep and did not wake until the stage drew up at the door of the United States Hotel in Wheeling at three o'clock in the morning. The passengers were so numb and cramped with cold that most of them had to be carried into the hotel. Mr. Wyman, the guardian, was undeniably drunk. I am sorry to record it, but the truth compels me to make the statement. His bottle was empty. He tried to sing, made a failure, and sank into a chair and was soon asleep. I booked the names and had him carried up to his room and returned to look after my fair charge. The office room was crowded as other stages had arrived. A glorious soft coal fire blazed up in an open grate. The jovial landlord and assistants were busy attending to the various calls and concocting mysterious hot drinks. Colored servants were carrying trunks and showing the sleepy ones to their rooms. My charmer was seated in an easy chair, her eyes fixed on the glowing coals, and as I watched her brilliant features lit up by fire, I thought I never saw a more charming girl. And my loyalty to my loved ones at home was seriously tried. When a colored girl came to show her her room, I assisted her to rise, when with a silly laugh she said to my astonishment, Don't leave me, love. Come with me. I saw that she had a touch of the same complaint that troubled her guardian. In fact, she had taken too much strong hot whiskey punch, and the heat of her room sent it to her head. To avoid a scene, I went with her and the girl to her room door, and then I was obliged to tear myself away. Next morning, Miss Fulton did not make her appearance at the breakfast table, but that afternoon we walked out and she was as loving as ever. The Ohio River was frozen up solid. No boats had passed for a week. The town was full of strangers. The hotels crowded, the price of board gone up, and no signs of a thaw. Some few days after this, I and my enchantress took a long walk on the hills. She was more quiet than usual, and after walking some time in silence, she remarked, We are going back to Baltimore in a few days. You will accompany us, of course. I hesitated, and her eyes blazed up with a sudden fury, and she broke out with, You must and shall come. I always have my own way, and I say you shall go with me and live with me, and threw her arms around me and sobbed like a child. Somehow, this violent exhibition of passion killed all my tender feelings for her, and I tried to make her understand that it was impossible, that I must go to Illinois, that I was a mere boy, not sixteen, poor and without friends, with nothing but his own strength to fight the battles of life, while she was a young lady of nineteen, rich, and with a host of friends. The thing was not possible. I might as well have reasoned with a whirlwind. She fairly raved, declared I did not love her, then she would call me a mean Yankee and say she hated me. Her guardy should kill me, and the next moment declare she would marry me and go to Illinois with me. I almost consented. Visions of returning to Boston with a rich heiress as my wife, the sensation it would make, flittered before me. I really liked the girl. I blamed myself for the part I had taken, but I thought of the one so dear to me at home, of my desire to go into and see the world. With my arm around her waist, I led her to a seat, and then after long and tender conversation, I solemnly swore that I would join her as soon as I could after visiting Illinois. She became satisfied. We vowed eternal love and constancy, ratified our engagement with many a kiss, and I intended fully to keep my contract to the letter and spirit. But l'homme propose et du dispose. Two days after, they started back to Baltimore, to proceed from there by the southern route. Our parting took place in the privacy of her own room and we considered ourselves man and wife. As she rode away, I regretted that I had not gone with them. I had paradise open before me, and I had refused to enter. I was perfectly miserable and mad with myself. I wrote, as agreed on, to Baltimore, stated all my feelings and regrets, and five days after I got three loving and tender epistles, but not an answer as she had not received mine yet.